Okay, let me just recap what I uh, said yesterday uh, briefly. Uh, so yesterday we talked about the limit distribution for extreme value statistics. So we said that these limit distributions are also stable distribution for the maximum. So in the sense that if you draw random variables from these distributions, let's say two or any number, finite number of them, and ask what is the maximum of those variables. So that's also given by the same distributions. Of course, you have to scale and uh, shift it, okay? So, and then we saw, we, okay, what we said that, okay, that the all possible limit distributions for ID random variables can be found by solving this equation dn, and all possible solutions of this equation will give you all possible functional forms, right? So then, what we found that it admits three kinds of, only three classes of solutions you can have for this kind of equation where f is a, some variable between zero and one, so restricting f between zero and one and real, only you can have three kinds of solution. So one corresponds to cn equal to 1. So basically, it's given by the solution of the equation fz to the power n is equal to f of z plus dn. And then what we found is that the solution of this equation, and we said that the, we found that solution of this equation is given by f of z is exponential of minus exponential of minus z. Okay, so this is one class we found. Then we found an where f of z, f of zero is zero, the function is zero at, so this is the case where cn not equal to one. So there's one case where, so f at zero can have only two possible values. One is at zero is zero and the other is f at zero is equal to one. And then what we found that this is given by the solution of this equation and is equal to f of cn z. And then we found that the solution of this given by exponential of minus one by z to the power alpha, where alpha is some positive number, and z is greater than zero. And so the, or in other sense, the range of z is zero to infinity. Okay, so this function is zero for z less than zero. And then we found another one where this is still given by the C and Z. So it's just given by the same equation, but with a different boundary condition. And if you take this boundary condition, then the solution is given by minus Z to the power beta, where beta is greater than zero. And the range of Z should be negative because at zero, it's one, so it, f cannot be more than one, so f is a monotonically increasing function, so therefore the range of z is from minus infinity to zero. So these are the all, these are the only three possible classes of solution you can have. Okay? So this one is known as Gumbel class or fischer tippett gumbel class, okay? So this is known as Fresse, and this one is known as okay? So these are the only three possible classes of limiting distribution for random extreme values for ID random variables, okay? So these are the only three possible 
classes. And then what we say is that, so if, so these distributions, of course, doesn't depend on the details of the variables from which you are drawing the random variables. It only depends on the tail. So if your random variables you draw from some p of x, so if it has a power law tail, let's say x1 plus alpha as x goes to infinity, so then the corresponding f of z is belongs to the class Presse. So therefore, it means it's given by this. So if it is faster than a, so this is the power law. So this is for this is power law. So faster than a power law. Okay. But unbounded, right? Basically, x goes all the way up to infinity. So then, the corresponding class is Gumbel. So this example of this kind of thing is where p of x goes like exponential of minus, let's say, x to the power delta, okay? And there is a third class, which is bounded, okay? So in the in sense that p of x is strictly zero for some value x greater than a, okay? So it's only, there's a upper support for p of x, Right, so this random variable has an upper bound, and in that case, your f of z is given by. Okay, so these are the three classes of random value distributions for ID random variables. Okay, so so this. So the, and then, okay, since these are only three classes, so it doesn't matter whatever your sample it, you choose, it belongs to one of these. And that's why these distributions are quite important and you can basically see it in many places. Yeah. So today I'm going to do, ask a slightly different questions. Of course, these extreme values are very important because uh, let's say uh, it's very important to know what is the largest flood in let's say 100 years because if you want to build a dam or something, so you, you should know this kind of information, right? Or if you want to, uh, you should know what is the, let's say, largest amount of water a reservoir can keep because every year there'll be some water coming to the reservoir and you don't want to build a reservoir based on your typical water coming into the reservoir, but you want to probably build it uh, uh, aiming for the extreme events, right? So these are very, uh, important events, but there's a equally important question, and that question is how many events occur near the extreme. So let's say you have a sample of N. Let's say you have a flood data for the last 100 years. You know that what is the largest flood. The question is, how many other events are there which is near that extreme value? Right? So these are called near extreme events. So this topic is basically called near extreme events, right? So the answer to this question, 
basically tells you whether this extreme event is an isolated event or there are many events which are near these extreme events. So why is it important? Because imagine that uh, there's an insurance company and people, uh, you pay insurance and whatever, whenever something happens, the insurance company has to pay back money, right? So you might ask, uh, what is the largest amount of money the insurance company had to pay? Okay, suppose, suppose it's quite large. But suppose that money was, it just paid once, but there all the other insurance claim was much smaller than that money, right? So that's scenario one. Now consider a different scenario where the largest amount of money the insurance company paid was smaller than the previous case, but there are lots of claims near that claim. So then for the insurance company, that was, the second case is probably more important because the company has probably paid more money than the, in the previous case, right? So similarly, you might ask, okay, what is the largest, uh, I mean, like a highest temperature in June in this month somewhere, let's say, in Bangalore or something, okay? So in one case, okay, it's, let's say it's some 50 degrees centigrade, but most of the other days, it just stays, uh, stayed uh, well below 45 or something. Right? So one day you can somehow uh, leave. Okay, you just put AC or something or probably don't go outside. You can leave. But in the second scenario, let's say there are many days, the highest temperature is let's say 47, but there are many days the temperature was between 46 and 47. Right? So therefore that second stage is more crucial. So it says that okay, that there are a lot of events near the extreme events. So the ex extreme, there are a lot of crowding near the extreme events. Okay, so now, so this is a question one like to understand how crowding is near an extreme events, right? So it's also sometimes in computer science, for example, uh, there is optimization problem, right? So optimization problem is basically find out, finding out the optimal solution to something. And it's usually quite hard to find this optimal solution and there's a huge field in this thing, but sometimes I mean, the optimal solution may not be like a so crucial for you. If you find some solution which is near optimal, that might be as good as you, as good as this optimal one. And if there are a lot of near optimal solutions, right, then it might be easy to find the near optimal solution quickly, right? So therefore, this near extreme events, so it's a very important this thing, and this we are going to address this question by some quantitative means. Okay, so this is, I'll just give it a reference. Uh, so this is a work, uh, okay, so we did with uh, Satya. He's uh, there, right? So this is a reference where, okay. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. So there is another uh, one for correlated random variables, basically for Brownian motion. So there's a work by So this is again a URL. Everyone? So you can look at this one, but uh, so today's lecture, I'm not going to talk about this one. So I'm going to focus on this uh, first one, okay? So now, 
whatever I have said so far, these are just words, right? So I'm saying that, okay, there's a crowding near uh, extreme value. And how do you measure it? In, how do you measure it quantitatively? So can you find given object which measures this kind of uh, near extreme events, right? Yeah. So in physics also, this is important. Like for example, if you have this random samples, so and often in the uh, low temperature, you are interested in the ground state, right? So many cases, the ground state is important. And ground state is, of course, depends on the sample to sample. It changes from sample to sample. So therefore, this ground state is like looking at the uh, minimum of some random variables, OK? And again, sometimes low temperature, what matters is the density of states near the ground state. And this is something like a density of states near the ground state, OK? So therefore, we want to look at some object, which is like the density of states, uh, but with respect to the maximum, OK? So the quantity we are going to look at is density of states with respect to the maximum, right? This is the obje uh, object we are going to define, OK? So let's call this R n. So maybe, so maybe like, let me just give a picture here, uh, OK? So okay, let's say this is some sequence. This is some time sequence. And this is the value of your random variables, like x1, x2, x3. These are IID. Let's say the first value is somewhere here. OK? So this is second value, let's say, somewhere here. Third value is somewhere here. Fourth value is somewhere here. Fifth value is somewhere here. And sixth value is somewhere here. Seventh value is somewhere there and so on, right? So these are just independent variable. So now which one is the maximum? This is the maximum. Okay, so now what we want to look at is, so this n is very large. So now we are going to put our origin at the maximum and look at how many events are there. If I just measure from the maximum at a distance r and r plus dr from the maximum. So suppose I just look at something like that. So this is my R. So I just put a line here. And this is my DR. So this is my DR, which is small. So how many events are there during in this band? Right? So for example, in this example, there is one. But when N becomes infinity, you imagine that there will be many and many events. So how does it behave with R? So rho R N times DR is the number of events between R and R plus DR. OK? Uh, so instead of the number, we'll just look at the fraction. So we'll just divide it by 1 over n. And i goes from 1 to n. So these are the number of events. And how do you find out those events? You just put a delta function, right? So delta of r minus x max minus xi. Right, so this is the object uh, we are going to find out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If the maxima is degenerated, that's the case where your random variables you are drawing from a discrete uh, probability distribution, not a continuous probability distribution function. And for discrete distributions, of course, uh, if you have n variables, if you draw n random variables, and if your uh, distribution, it depends on how many discrete values that distribution take, right? If the number of values that distribution, uh, the random variables, uh, the values the random variable take is less than n, of course, there will be repetition of uh, 
this thing, right? Repetition of, I mean, you will get many values with the same maxima. You might get the same values with the maxima, right? There will be some repetition somewhere. Else. So, uh, so these calculations, whatever we have done, is for continuous distributions. So when the random variables are drawn from continuous distributions. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like uh, saying that if I just uh, give you a line and yes, if I just draw a point, what is the probability that the point is exactly on that line? It's zero, no? Yeah. So, so it's so basically, if you ask what is the probability that there is a maximum between some x and x between x and x plus dx, right? For very small dx, that's there will be just uh, one even, right? Because the other one will be the higher order. So, you'll, so it's asking that if you just draw it from a continuum, very continuous distribution, what is the probability that two values are exactly the same? The probability of two values exactly the same is zero if you draw from continuous distribution, right? Okay. So this is the object we are going to look at. So this is what we are going to say: the density of states with respect to the maximum. Right? So this is what we are going to look at. So when you write down something, first thing you should check is normalization. Right? So when, because it's like a uh, frac uh, fractional number. So if I just integrate over all r, it should uh, find all the events. So what you should check is the normalization. So 0 to infinity dr. This is because these are just the delta function. It will just go through, and there will be n, so it's just normalized to 1, right? So anytime you write down anything fraction or probability distribution function, you should always, first thing you should check is the normalization thing, right? Okay. So now, uh, so this object, Still a random variable, right? Because your x max will change from realization to realization. So if you take one realization of n random variables, this x max will be different. As we see, saw that those are given by one of these limit distributions. And even this x size will be different, right? So right hand side, all these guys are random variables. So therefore, this is also a random variable, right? And you can ask uh, all, so it, dep it basically changes from sample to sample, and you can ask the statistical properties of this object. Okay. What is the so first question you might ask, what is the mean? Right? So what is the mean? So that's basically given by mean rho r n. So let me just put a bar to define mean. So that's equal to 1 over n, i equal to 1 to n, delta of r minus x max minus xi, expectation value. So I have to evaluate this expectation value with respect to so so what are the random variables here? X max and xi, both, right? So if I want to evaluate this expectation value, so I need the joint distribution of this x max and x, right? So this is what we are going to uh, focus on today, OK? So what we need is the joint distribution of x max and So we need a joint distribution, OK? So let me define this joint distribution. Let's call it x, y, dy, OK? So that means it's a density with respect to one of the variables. 
So that's why I put it there. So let me say that, so let me define this as the probability that your maximum is less than x and a random variable y. So this y is one of the random variables from the sample. Okay. And that is, I mean, one of the random variable, let's call it xi, which is between y and y plus dy. Right? So this is the joint probability distribution. Okay? Joint distribution, the maximum is less than some value x, and your random variable xi is between y and y plus di. Okay? So now, if these are iid random variables. So for iid random variables, okay. So you can write down w x y. So what is it? So there is one guy who takes value y. These are id, right? Its variables are independent of each other, right? There's one object which takes value y. And the other variables, n minus one variables, takes value less than x, right? So there are n minus one variable. And there are n minus one, they factorize. And of course, the, since this is the maximum is less than x, this y must be less than x, right? So there's a theta function which says that y is less than x, right? So this is what you have. Again, once you have this, you should check that whatever you have written is correct. How do you check it? You check various limits. For example, if you take x goes to infinity, y. So what is this object? This is just that I have taken that maximum is, say the maximum is less than infinity, right? So it doesn't matter where the maximum is, and this should give, what did I do? Py, right? Because if it is infinity, this will just give me y, so this is just Py, right? So it just gives me the distribution of y, right? This is what you check, and the other thing you check is that if I integrate with respect to y, what should I get? This is a joint distribution, uh, uh, qy, so if I, ah, that's the q, yes. So if you, x, y, dy, so if I integrate over this object from minus infinity to plus infinity, this theta function is there, right? So therefore I can just put it all plus in the Then you see that this is just, this is already there, and there'll be integral over this one from minus infinity to x. So it will be just minus infinity to x, px prime dx prime to the power n. And this is what, this is the, uh, uh? Ah, yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. okay, that's what I should write it there, <laughs> yeah. So these are two separate, okay? So this is one and this is two, okay? So this is, you see that now if I just integrate over y, this should get, and what do you get? So this is the probability that your x max is less than x. So this is what we call q, 
This is what we do calling qn of x in the previous lectures. Okay, so this is what we get. So now we need the joint PDF with respect to both x and y, joint distribution uh, density with respect to x and y. So how do you get a joint density given that it's cumulative with respect to one variable? So how will you find out the density? You just differentiate, right? Okay. So let's just differentiate. Okay, let me just say that these are capital W's, okay? Because it might just look, okay, these are my capital W's. And that one, let me just define by small w, okay? So small w of x, y is basically del del x of capital W of x, y, okay? So now we can carry out the differentiation. Let me just put this one. This is an important thing. Let me just carry out the differentiation with respect to x. Okay. So where are the x's? X is here and x is here. Right? So let me just first do the differentiation of this guy. So what does it give? If you differentiate a theta function, it gives me a delta function. So that is Okay, so there's minus infinity to x, px prime dx prime to the power n minus one, n minus one delta of x minus y, and then py. And py is same as px, right, because of this delta function, right? So I can actually write it px, right? Because since this delta function is there, so I can write it there. Okay, write it py, it doesn't matter. Then you have this other term. Let me just take out this uh, theta of x minus y. Let me just keep it outside. Uh, this py also, let me just keep it outside, right? And then this guy, what is the difference of this guy? So n minus one of this thing to the power n minus two, right? Let me just write it there, minus infinity to x, px prime, dx prime, and then the differentiation of this guy. So if, if you differentiate with respect to this one, then you get p of x, right? This is what you get. Now, so this is the density with respect to both x and y, right? So if I integrate over y, what should I get? W x y dy right, is useful to always uh, do this check. What do you get? This one integrate over y. This as delta function goes away. So you had e x times n minus one, that thing inside. And this one, if you integrate over y, n minus one, this thing, and then the p x is, of course, there. And you are integrating over y, from minus infinity to plus infinity, but this uh, theta function, so minus infinity to x. So that's same as this guy's terms here. So the same term with n minus one. 
Right? So it's the same term. So what you have is n times ex times minus infinity to x dx prime dx prime to the power n minus 1. So what is this object? This is small q or this is basically let me just write it. So this is just the distribution of the maximum right for a given n right because that was the cumulative and that's the density right probably density function of the maximum okay so this is what we have okay so now in terms of this we can rewrite our w w x y so we can rewrite it where is w this one right this one so this term is similar to this term so there is this delta x minus y right so if i divide it by n and multiply by n so divide by n and multiply it by n then whatever this thing is n times this times this this is just the p max of xn this is the first term and what is the second term second term is theta of x minus y right theta of x minus y py py and what is the things left n minus 1 px this to the power n minus 2 is again the p max of x but with n minus 1 variables right so this is what we have so we have basically written down this in terms of this p max and py right so given this we can now evaluate this one see this is a sum right so i can evaluate each guys individually and sum it up so it just depends on therefore only joint distribution of two variables suppose i wanted to evaluate the first take the square and uh, evaluate the expectation value then i would have needed joint distribution of three random variables the x max and some x y and x i and x x z right so here since i need this so you can i can just evaluate this quantity you now right so what is this quantity delta r minus x max minus some variable x what is this expectation value this is basically dx minus infinity to plus infinity minus infinity to plus infinity dy the joint density of x and y and then this delta function delta function of delta function of r minus uh, which one is my x which one is my y x minus y right so this is the integral i have to do right so the first one of course you can immediately see that what is the first one I have to, this is the expression for w so what does it give so first one gives this is this one becomes just the r because x minus 1 is x minus is r divided by n and uh, what is it right and then
the chal, right? Because it says that, okay, if I just, for example, if I just do a first integrate sum with respect to y, that gives me this one, then the integral sum with respect to the p x variable, but p max is normalized, so that will give me one, right? So you should check that here, again, p max x n dx minus infinity to plus infinity, this is one, right? This is a probability density function, so it should be normalized to one, right? So therefore, this is the first term you get. So what is the second term now? If you do the second term, of course, this one is just give me x minus y is r. And then I have these integrals. Uh, I'll do one of the integrals. Let's, what is this one? It's p of y. So I'll do one of the integrals. Let's say I do the integral with respect to y. Then I have an integral with respect to x plus infinity. Uh, if I do the integral with respect to y, what do I get? P y becomes x minus r, right? Because because of this delta function, and then this other object is just p max x and minus one, right? So this is what I get. Right? It's of course independent of i because okay, these are i d and these are in, uh, identically distributed. For any i, I'll get the same form, right? So therefore, I can. When I want to find this one, is the same guys, but divided by n, it's essentially the same one, right? So, so there's a term. What is this term? It says that, okay, I have ID random variable. I'm looking at the density with respect to the maximum. And one of those variables is, of course, the maximum. And that gives you this delta function, right? Okay. So I can look at the variable excluding the maximum, right? So let me just call it rho plus Rn. So this is your rho Rn minus delta R by N, okay? So this is, I'm just excluding this maximum itself, so I'm not counting the maximum. And that's given by this integral, right? This r, I can this theta function, I can just uh, throw away because I'm just looking at r greater than zero. So this theta function is always satisfied. So therefore, this is dx p of x minus r p x of x and minus one, right? So this is what you have. This is what you have, okay? So now, so we saw that earlier for the distribution of the maximum, there are these limit distributions, right? So only three limit forms are possible. So the similar question now we want to ask, if we now take n to be very large, if n goes to infinity, does it approach any limit form, right? Similar, the, the similar way we have uh, found it there, okay? Is there a limiting form, okay? Uh, so what we found earlier that, let me just rewrite in terms of this. So what we found that E max, has this limit form, this is the density. So if I just put a n plus b n z for n, since it's the density, I should multiply by b n, right? So what we found is that this in the limit 
n goes to infinity, it's given by some limiting distribution, and this is basically the derivative of that uh, three functions I have written down, right? So your p max is given by that, and with this limiting form now, for large n, is there a limiting form, form for this object? Right? So that's what we want to find. That's the goal. Okay. Now, for that, okay, so now, let me also write it this way, the same one. So it says basically, okay, p max of xn, for large n, basically it goes like the function of x minus a n by b n, 1 over b n, right? So this, I mean, this is equivalent to this one as n goes to infinity. So x, typical value of x is around a n, there's a fluctuation of b n, and near the typical value, if you're looking at a, or a fluctuation of order b n, so that basically approaches this function f. Okay, so that's the limiting form for this object. Okay? And n minus n, 1 and n is on the same, basically, for large n. Okay? So therefore, we need to now find out how does this fluctuation grow for large n. As you increase n, the fluctuation becomes smaller or fluctuation becomes larger. Right? Because we have two, this is a probability density, this is a probability density, this is a product of True probability density, we have to find out basically which one is sharply peaked with respect to the another, right? If one of the density is sharply peaked, then what we can do is basically we can replace it by the value at the peak and then integrate over the other object, right? So this is what, when you integrate over delta function, why does it give you the, why does it give you the, uh, okay, so this is basically same as, uh, Suppose you have a, in, you have a function, let's say f of x times delta of x minus a dx, right? So what is this? f of a, why do you get f of a? It's sharply picked at A, so that's where this function contributes, and all the other places it's uh, basically uh, zero, right? So this is where it picks up. So now if you, similarly, if you have a function which is sharp, product of two functions, now imagine, uh, forget, instead of delta x, so if you have some function which is sharply picked and another function which is something like that, right? So then what you can do is, so you have suppose two functions now. Instead of that, now imagine something like you have an integral uh, plus infinity fx gx dx, like this product of, product of two functions. And one function is sharply picked with respect to the another. Suppose I want to plot these functions the function of x, let's say, let's say one function is something like that. Okay, let's say this is your f of x. And z of x is suppose something like something like that, right? So how are you going to evaluate this integral? So this is, let's say, some value at A, right? So this integral, see, around A, this function f doesn't change too much, right? So therefore, this integral is equivalent to, I'm just taking the value at some point, f of A, and integrating this other function. Right? 
So this is you can do always whenever one function is very sharply peaked with respect to the another one. Okay, and so we want to put this two functions in certain way so that one guy is sharply peaked with respect to another one. And peaks are usually given by these fluctuations, how sharply peaked B n. So we want to find out how does B n depend on uh, 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 n. Okay. So I guess you remember this yesterday's lectures. So how does Bn depend on n? Right? So let's recall the examples we did in the last class. E of x goes like e to the power minus x to the power delta. So the tail is given by this. So what is Bn? Can you tell me? For this case, Bn goes like We've done yesterday, no? How does Bn behave? Log n to the power 1 minus one over delta minus one. Right? Is it correct? Hmm? Okay. One over delta minus one. I think I was supposed to take the C L of chalks now. Okay. So now, so what happens? So if delta is greater than one, okay. If delta is equal to one, what happens? Delta is equal to one, Bn is of order one, independent of n, right? It's independent of n. Of n, okay? Uh, If delta less than one, what happened? If this is less than one, this is greater than one minus one, so this is a positive power. So Bn goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. Right? So the fluctuation increases with increasing n. What happens if delta is greater than 1? So this is the pure exponential tail, right? This is something decaying slower than exponential. This is something decaying faster than exponential. So what happened to that? In this case, Bn goes to, this is something greater than 1, so this is a negative number, so it will be 1 over something. So this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity, right? So these are the three behaviors for exponential. Now, okay, so there's a case, pure exponential, slower than pure exponential, faster than pure exponential, right? So let's also look at the other slower side, which is the power law. It's even uh, slow. Right? So let's look at the power law case. So what is the Bn? Do you remember Bn for the power law case? n to the power 1 over alpha 
it goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. So it's same as this one, right? Let's look at the slower case, uh, faster case, which is the, right, even faster than this one. So how does Bn go? In this case, one of her n to the power one of her beta this goes to zero as n goes to infinity, right? So therefore, you see that this almost this basically covers all the cases, right? So therefore, we see that there's a pure exponential case for which b n is of order one. There's a case which is faster than uh, faster than exponential where b n goes to zero and there's a slower than exponential case where bn goes to infinity. So you have three classes. Right? One is the pure exponential tail. Second one is slower than your tail. And third is faster than your tail. Right, so these are the three cases, and we'll see that basically in these three cases, we'll get uh, generically three different, different kind of behaviors, right? So basically, we have to just find out, analyze this right-hand side in these three regimes, and find out three different behaviors, okay? So let's look at the case where it's slower than pure exponential, okay? First, let's look at the case which is slower than pure exponential. This one, slower than your your exponential okay so in this case what was that thing okay so this is bn is order 1 slower than pure exponential bn goes to infinity as n goes to infinity, right? And this one, bn goes to zero as n goes to infinity, right? So this is the three cases. This is something intuitively, can you understand it intuitively? Because if you have a fat tail, right? Long, uh, uh, these are called fat tails. Uh, I mean, okay. So fat tails usually call this power laws are called fat tails, but okay. suppose you have a tail which is decaying slowly. That means you have more probability of finding something at that tail, right? So therefore the maximum can be at large and there will be also too much fluctuation. There will be a lot of fluctuation, right? But if something is decaying very fast, so maximum is kind of like, a, okay, it says that, okay, maximum, you cannot go to, too much on the right, right, your tail is tailing, but you, you are drawing all these random numbers, so they are also somewhere there, right? So therefore, it cannot, okay, maximum basically wants to go towards the end, but then there cannot be too, many, uh, too much fluctuations, right? So if you have broad tail, the maximum can go very far, and there's a lot of fluctuations, okay? And, okay, it's not clear why 
mathematically of course it's clear but physically it's not clear why pure exponential is the cut uh, device this two but this is what it is okay so now in this case we have that formula so make a change of variable x equal to change of variable x equal to a n plus b n z. Right? And what does it what does that integral give? Rho, I'm looking at the plus part. So what does it give? So this integral now instead of x it becomes z, right? So it's in fact b n dz then p of x becomes a n plus b n z minus r and then p max of a n plus b n z n minus 1. So n is large, so actually it is n minus 1 and n doesn't matter, right? Uh, this will just give you uh, higher order corrections. Okay, so now let's write down this in a slightly different way. So, okay, so this one let's organize a bit different way. So, this is equal to b n z minus r minus a n right i have just written down this way but this is also same as so i can take b n outside z minus r minus a n by b n. I'm just re rearranging the terms. Okay. And this is again same as z minus r minus a n by b n 1 over b n. I'm just rearranging that. I did not do anything else. Okay. So therefore this guy is dz this bn i'll keep okay don't worry about this bn dz is p okay, let's just keep this b, uh, p of z minus r minus an by bn divided by one of our bn okay and then this guy is let's put bn p max an plus bnz and minus one right this bn i have put it here okay this one in this scale, I should just put a 1 over 1 minus bn here and just multiply 1 over 1 minus bn there. So 1 over 1 minus bn is the same as bn. So I just put there and I have divided by 1 over bn. Okay. Now I take n going to infinity limit. Okay. So what happens if we take n going to infinity limit? So bn, so this one you can see that in the n going to infinity limit this guy what happened to this guy f of z right so it becomes f of z and what happened to this guy So, so Pn is something, Pn goes to 
P of x goes to 0 at the infinity, right? And presumably some function which is a peak, okay? Now if bn goes to infinity, so what happened? This becomes 0, okay? So therefore this argument becomes infinity most of the places except when z is near this one, right? So you have divided something divided by 0, right? So most of the places where z is much greater than r minus an by bn on both sides, this is basically infinity, right? So therefore this is the p is 0 at that point, right? Except at this point, so it has some finite value, and that value, of course, it goes to infinity because of this bn. So what kind of function is this? This becomes a delta function. So this becomes basically delta of z minus r minus an by bn, right? So this is basically, it becomes minus infinity to plus infinity dz delta of r minus, sorry, z minus r minus an by bn f of z. So this is basically given by f of there's a 1 by bn. So this is given by 1 over bn f of r minus n by b. So what we have found is that if the tail of the distribution decays slower than the pure exponential tail, then your this density of states with respect to the maximum is given by the distribution of the extreme itself. Function is given by the distribution of the axiom itself with this argument. So typical R is around a n. So the typical uh, events will be near a n, and there will be, of course, a lot of fluctuations because b n is large, but it's given by the, the function f itself. But this function f can be different in two cases. It's a slower than pure exponential. So, but slower than pure exponential, as you see that it includes both exponential and power law. So therefore, if it is exponential but slower than exponential, so this will basically function will be belong to the Gamble class. And if it is the power law, then it will become to the Fresier class. Right? But it's basically given by the extreme value itself, distribution of the extreme value itself. Okay. So let's look at the case where it's faster than now. Uh, exponential. This one I can erase. So slower than pure exponential. So what we found is that rho plus Rn is given by extreme value distribution itself. Right? So this is what we found. So now the case which is faster than exponential. Yeah. So uh, minus Bn times P max uh, is it P max is delta P? No, because uh, this one, no? Q and an plus bn z is f of z, right? So what is f prime? Is 1 over bn q prime. Right of n plus n z. This is the Jacobian, right, of the transformation. Yeah. So now faster than pure exponential.
So in this case, b n goes to zero, right? So b n goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So therefore, you already saw that e max of n plus p max of x, of course, is given by one over b n f of right. Now b n goes to zero again. This function is basically highly peaked, right? So therefore, I can just take the value of this other uh, probability density in that integral at that peak, and then integrate over this function. But when I integrate over this function, it just gives me one. So therefore, what I have is rho plus r n is now I take out this other guy p of it's highly picked at a n so r minus a n times the integral over this one and that's one right so it just says okay times one over b n f of z x minus n by b n dx but well, this is equal to one by definition because it's a probability density function okay so now basically what we have is in the second case if it is faster than the pure exponential then your density of states is given by the function itself from which you have drawn the your random variables from okay so these are these two classes and then you have this your your exponential case in this case bn is of order 1 so therefore both the densities in that integral these are similarly picked basically these are of similar distinct so you cannot scale it out and in this case you have to so this is a third class, but the third class is basically you have to work it out. And let me just give you a homework problem. So it says that basically in this case, it's neither here or nor there. And homework problem is that, okay, for so that, so that is just a simple exponential integrals, right? So you can just do it. When p of x equal to theta of x, e to the power minus x. So it means basically just x is on only takes positive value, show that limit n goes to infinity uh, rho plus of a n plus b n, uh, let's call a variable, okay, y times n. So this variable this function is given by exponential of y times 1 minus 1 plus exponential of minus y exponential minus exponential minus y. So this is something homework, so you should just do it. Which one? This should be an minus r n. Which one? Uh, what was the thing there? X minus R, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so this is what we have, okay? So basically what we have, this density, mean density of states belongs to three classes. One is a pure exponential class, let's say it's given by this. One is faster than pure exponential class, which is given by this, the uh, uh, probability density function itself. And one is a slower than pure exponential case. In this case, it's given by the uh, corresponding uh, extreme value distributions. Okay, so these are these three classes basically. Okay. So now, okay, so you can ask now, okay, if you have correlations, how does this change, etc. 
And that uh, reference I had given you in the uh, beginning, so they do it basically, suppose now instead of I IID, suppose this is basically a correlated time series. Okay, so I have uh, just five minutes, so let me quickly tell you something. Uh, okay, before that, if you have some question, you can just tell me. Yeah, ask. Yeah. It has a simple explanation in the sense that it says basically that, okay, this is the distribution of the maximum. And given the distribution of the maximum, what is the probability that finding something at uh, this uh, uh, object which is away from, r distance away from the maximum? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you have this n minus 1 object. So that's like the distribution of the maximum of this n minus 1. And the another guy is basically at a distance which is uh, away from this one. So this is at x and then r distance away from the distance. Yeah. Okay, so let me quickly just tell you something then if you have any other, do you have any questions? No. Okay, so let me just tell you something about correlations. See, so far what we have done is the case where there is no correlation between the random variables, right? So now if there is correlation between the random variable, what do you expect? So if the correlation is not very long range, let's say it's only its alternate variables are correlated or some, it's, there's a correlation length uh, and then after that variables are not correlated. So naively you will expect, okay, in that sense that, okay, because your n is very large, so if you just make a bigger block, which is uh, greater than your correlation length, and then you look at the maximum within that block, and then maximum that other block, so those maximums will be probably not correlated, and this should go through. But if the variables are highly correlated, of course it will be quite different, right? So Saito is going to talk about these highly correlated random variables, right? Yesterday he already talked about this random matrix theory, I, again values of random matrix theory, right? And he's going to, I think, show you today that these are very highly correlated random variables and what happened to the maximum of those highly correlated random variables, okay? So today let me just give you a simpler example and that's just build the correlation from ID itself. Right? So we have considered this set x1, x2, x3, but instead of this x1, x2, now just let me just change the notation and just call it I want to okay. So these are ID random variables, okay? So these are ID. random variables. So let me now, from this ID random variable, let me construct a another time series, okay? Let's call x1 is this one, x2 x3 and so on, xn is right. So this is a time series, it's highly correlated because you see that there are common elements, okay. So although these guys are uncorrelated, this time series is highly correlated, okay. So let me, and this, let's say these guys are drawn from some distribution i of xi. Let's take it to be, for the time being, symmetric and continuous. Okay? So do you recognize this time series? 
Any of you recognize this time series? So this is just a random work because if I just write down x n minus x n minus 1, right? Their difference is just a id random variable, right? So x2 minus x1 is this guy, x3 minus x2 is just is that t and so on, right? So this is a random work. Okay. So these are drawn from some distribution phi of xi. Okay. Now you can ask the same question, what is the distribution of the maximum of this time series? Okay. And so instead of that, let me just, and this problem, okay, so this is in fact a quite hard problem, although I mean, it's known, and uh, Satyo has worked on this problem for any distribution of this uh, variable xi. So let me just go to a simpler problem. Just replace this. So what is xn? So xn is i equal to 1 to n i, right? So let me just replace this sum by an integral, right? So let me look, look at a simpler problem. which is x at t is just the integral from 0 to t. And these are uncorrelated random variables, delta correlated random variables, right? So this one, you can also write dx dt is, right? So you can ask this question, now what is the maximum of, so if I have this, time series generated by, it's now a continuous curve generated by this equation. What is the distribution of the maximum of this equation? So how does this time series evolve? This I guess I have five more minutes, no? Yeah. So you can again define this quantity what you have defined earlier. So you start with some point, let's assume that you have started with point zero. And you define this quantity qn of x, qt of x now, t is a variable, is the probability that maximum is less than x. Let's call it m, to so denote maximum, less than m, starting with x at time 0 is 0, right? So this is basically, so this is your m, you start with there, and the trajectory of this guy looks something like that, and you want the probability that this curve remains below this line, x equal to m, right? Since this is homogeneous, it doesn't matter, I can just shift the space, and I can also ask, this one I can, zero I can take it to there and this becomes minus m, right? So then this is just starting at minus m, what is the probability that? This is same as probability that maximum less than zero starting with x zero is equal to minus m, right? This is again symmetric, right? Both x to minus x. So this is therefore, I can flip it, and this is the same probability that if I start with m, right, instead of starting with minus m, what is the probability that it stays below zero? There's the same probability that if I start with m, I start with m, and this curve stays above zero, right? There's a symmetry between this curve and the other curve, right? For each realization of this curve, I can draw another realization of the other curve. Okay, and those curves have the same weight because your noise is symmetric, right? So therefore, this is the same as the probability that starting 
with x 0 equal to m, the this kind of curves are called Brownian motion, right? The curve generated by this equation, right? So it's called the stays above the so what is this probability called? So it's called basically if I start from somewhere, it stays above the origin. So these kind of probabilities are called survival probabilities, right? It says that, okay, imagine that there's some absorbing barrier, some glue is there, and this guy is some um, bacteria doing some Brownian motion, and once it touches the glue, it just dies or sticks, right? So it's the probability that as long as it doesn't touch that origin, it survives. So these probabilities are also called survival probability. Therefore, the distribution of the maximum is also the survival probability, same as the survival probability for this Brownian motion. Okay? And I'll not do it here, and the answer is basically, so it's quite nice, but this answer is basically given by Q of mt is given by error function of m by square root of 4 dt. Okay. So this is the this thing. So therefore, if you want to find out the probability density mt, this is just the derivative of this one. But m now is from 0 to infinity, right? It's only one side. So this is basically half Gaussian. So this is 1 over square root of pi dt exponential of minus m squared by 4 dt, right? So you see that it's, okay, so it's very different from the answers we got before, right? So you think that if you have correlation in the sense, in the system, that can give very different loss for the maximum. And this is a simpler case. And in Satya's course, he is talking, going to talk about the system where there are basically very strong correlation. So I think I'll just uh, stop it here. Sorry. Uh, no, no, this is true everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. It's true everywhere as long as your process is this one. For this process, this is true everywhere. Yeah. 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 Ah, so if you have a discrete, now if you now go back to your discrete case, then it will have very complicated expression. And in, in that expression, now if you scale your m and your time n in a certain way, and then only in the large m and large n limit with m by square root of n variable, you will get uh, to this. And the uh, discrete case is much more complicated, actually. I mean, you can still write down in terms of something called this uh, Weinerhof integrals. And, but uh, you can still solve it in the generating function uh, space but you cannot invert it uh, exactly, and it's very complicated, actually. Yeah. Huh? This is a distribution, uh, maximum is less than m. Yeah. So if I ask for maximum being less than m and minimum being greater than minus. Ah, so that you can do again. It's a different uh, question you're asking. Right, right. No, I was just asking is that 
yeah, yeah, it's known for the, uh, yeah, yeah, for Brownian motion it's known, but for this case it's not known. <laughs> for this case it's very hard and except uh, for exponential distribution of uh, this noise, it's not known. So in this case, instead of, so here you have a, okay, so when you write down here, let me just quickly write down the equation here. Okay. So what is the equation? So what is this question? You are asking starting with M, what is the probability that it doesn't cross origin up to time t? So let's say this is a probability that starting with M, up to time t plus dt, it doesn't cross the origin, right? So this is same as, so you start with m, and first time dt, you take a jump. So q of m plus dm or delta m, you take a jump, dm doesn't matter. And then you don't cross the origin starting from there for the time t. But you have to average with respect to all values of dm, right? So this you can see now that this is q of mt plus if we just expand in Taylor series, this is dm average plus dm square average by two del q del m plus dm square average by two del square q del m2 plus these higher order terms, right? So if you now take these two on the left hand side and divide it by del dt, so this becomes del q del t. This is equal to dm by dt del q del m plus okay, higher terms. Now if you have a jump which is symmetric, if the noise is symmetric, then this average of dm will be zero, right? So this term goes to zero and what is this guy? So this guy's go like 2 dt, right? So therefore, you have an equation which is del q del t is equal to d del square q uh, del, del m square. So this is the equation you have. So this is same as a diffusion equation, but the boundary conditions are now different, right? So boundary condition is that if you start with if m equal to zero, then what happen? You're asking what is the probability that it doesn't cross the origin. If you start with that, it already is there. So it's zero. So therefore this q of zero t is equal to zero. And what about if you start with infinity? So you start with infinity, you are going to stay above the origin for any finite time, right? You cannot come there. So Q of M goes to infinity, T is one. And you also need another condition, initial condition, right? There are two derivative here, one derivative here. So what is the initial condition? Q M zero is one, because you just, at the zero step, you don't cross the boundary if you are starting with M, right? So you can solve this equation with these three boundary condition. And when you solve this, you will basically get those, uh, get that thing. So yeah, so that continuum case is easy to do, but okay, if you go to this discrete case, it's a very hard problem. Yeah. Okay, so this is about basically something about if we have correlations in the system. Okay.